Welcome to another episode of Eric Wade Whiskey Studies, and thank you for joining me in my continuing study of the history of Scotch whiskey. Uh, we're going to be looking at the boom to bust in the history of Scotch whiskey, and this is really, really important because um, we need to pay attention to historical trends which had led to booms in terms of expansion uh, in the Scotch whiskey industry. Also, those things historically which have led to a bust um, and keep track of them because we have to be able to look at our own times and see are these things potentially going to happen now. But having said that, I've watched some Scotch whiskey documentaries and those who remember the bad times uh, tend to be a little skittish about the current growth in Scotch whiskey industry. There are distilleries opening up like crazy. Scotch whiskey is doing really, really well. And in good times, there are some people, remembering the bad times, get a little bit nervous. So rather than being nervous, uh, let's understand history. Understand what has gone on in the past. Understand the causes and effects of booms and busts in order to perhaps have a better understanding of what's going on in our own time and see how these cycles also go on uh, in other whiskey industries, or talk about American whiskeys, or bourbon, or Japanese whiskeys. All right, so uh, during this study, I'm gonna be enjoying a glass of Glen Morgy 12 year old. This is the La Santa, aged in uh, Oloroso sherry cast and Pedro Jimenez sherry cast. So it's a little more but more towards um, dried fruit characteristics uh, and a little bit sweeter. As you can see, I'm past the halfway mark. This is one that I really, 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 really like. So um, let's get into our notes. So as the decade progressed, investment in whiskey came to be fashionable with banks lending money for speculators to acquire both stocks of new make and maturing whiskey and distillery shares. Blending companies spent money on the acquisition of speculative stocks and new distillery projects. So understanding taxes and banks is really, really important. Are distilleries going beyond their means? Are they stretching themselves too far? Um, is there too much speculation which isn't based on uh, some better statistical evidence? Those are the sort of questions we wanna be asking. By the way, there's two things that sell really, really well. False fears and false hopes. False hopes tend to come in terms of get rich quick schemes, uh, instant success, uh, grow your hair back real, real right away, uh, lose weight without diet or exercise, those kind of things. False fears tend to be in terms of, hey, the end is nigh, world is, is coming to an end, those sort of doomsday predictions, all right? Those, those are the two things. Hey, we're about to have an economic crash, therefore buy my stocks or buy my books on how to make it through the hard times and or buy gold, buy this, you know. It, it, it's a way of selling something. Or subscribe to my particular uh, religion because doomsday is coming, that kind of a thing, right? That, that's sort of the basis of most cults, by the way, is false fears and false hopes. But get back into whiskey. Outwardly, the Scotch whiskey industry had never looked in better health. But all good things come to an end, and the years of plenty were soon to cease. Expansion of distillery capacity and the laying down of stock had significantly outpaced demand. As Moss and Hume, authors of The Making of Scotch Whiskey Note, stocks were built up to ridiculous levels. The annual increase in stock warehouse in Scotland rose from just under 2 million gallons, or 9 million liters, in 1891 to 1892 to 13.5 million gallons or 61.4 million liters. In 1897 to 1898 and 1898 to 1899, net additions to stock amounted to 40% or more of total output. So the rise in production of pot stills was largely paralleled by the patent still producers and grain whiskey output rose from 9.4 million gallons or 42.7 million liters in 1886 to nearly 21 million gallons or 95.4 million liters in the year 1900. Alrighty, let's give it a wee sniff. It's kind of sweet on the nose. Dried orange peel, 
fig, dates, raisins, sort of a uh, caramelized honey, um, sort of a Christmas cake. This is bottled at 43% alcohol by volume. A lot of nice floral notes as well, and a little bit of maltiness on the palate. Mm. It is on the sweeter side. It's really rich. This is a whiskey that has a lot of flavor, a lot of depth and flavor, a lot of complexity, and yet isn't real high in ABV. It's only 43%. But it's deriving a lot of its character and its flavor from the casks. It's, it's a cask-driven whiskey. Really, really, and really nice. And if you have a sweet tooth, definitely go for this one. Or if you want to introduce someone to uh, whiskeys, this is a good place to start because the sweeter uh, component really, really appeals to a lot of people. And there actually is sort of a chocolatey note as well. And I'm also getting a little bit of fudge character as well. All right, let's get back to our notes. When the boom years turned to bust, the catalyst was R&W Patterson, a Leith-based firm which had been established in 1849. Pattisons began to blend Scotch whiskey in their own right in 1887, as Pattison, Older and Company, and while apparently extremely successful with creative and ambitious promotions, both the Pattison brothers, Walter and Robert, were noted for their personal extravagance and flamboyance. And as early as the summer of 1894, uh, the business appeared to most observers to be flourishing, the Distillers Company Limited board described Pattison's finances as very doubtful. One of the stupidest things you can do when building a business is, and, and you're having some success, is to turn around and start buying things. You're buying uh, cars, big houses, taking luxury trips. You're spending your money on to live a higher lifestyle rather than reinvesting in your business. If they had reinvested in their business and built up the business and lived a little bit more frugally, they probably wouldn't have been in as much trouble. In 1896, the partnership became a public company with the two Patterson brothers owning all the ordinary shares and 25% of the preference shares. And they were also paid some 150,000 pounds in cash. Such was their level of expenditure and outlay. However, that despite the large injection of capital, in order to remain in business, the brothers had to resort to selling stock, which they bought back at inflated prices by obtaining bills of exchange, which were then discounted. In other words, sold at less than their face value on the London discount market. This resulted in greatly exaggerated valuations of their whiskey stocks. Amongst other dubious practices, the Pattisons also overvalued property which they owned, and in order to maintain an impression of probity, paid share dividends out of capital. December 1898, the firm collapsed and formal liquidation proceedings revealed a deficiency of 500,000 pounds. In 1901, Robert and Walter Patterson were convicted of embezzlement and fraud and sent to jail. Now, some of this should ring a bell. Um, in terms of the Enron scandal that we had in the Silicon Valley, right? Uh, there was a lot of boom going on in the dot-coms and the internet and, you know, businesses and all that. And then you had all these investors and so forth. Uh, and then there turned out to be some scandal and someone went to prison for it. And if we stay tuned, we're going to see the same thing happen way back then. There is nothing new under the sun, right? Um, what has happening now or today, what will happen, is similar or a repeat of what has happened in the past. And this is why studying history is so important. The wider consequences of what became known as the Patterson Crash were the bankruptcy of 10 individual companies with which Patterson's had done business and a slump in whiskey prices affecting distillers, blenders, and merchants throughout the industry. The Patterson's may have been at the center of the crash, but the brothers were far from being alone in being determined to believe that the good times would last forever. In reality, the Patterson collapse and its consequences 
meant that the Scotch whiskey industry saw no further growth in terms of distillery construction for a half a century, with Glen Elgin being the last distillery to open for business, starting production in May 1900, but closing just five months later. So sadly, when just a few make some really stupid decisions in their business, they aren't the only ones to be affected. There is a sort of a ripple effect in businesses with which they worked. Because if one business and vectors is sort of uh, leaning on that one, and then other businesses are leaning on that one, there is a sort of a, you know uh, weight that goes out and affects other businesses. So it wasn't just uh, the Patterson brothers that went down, but 10 others as well. And that continues to go on and on and on uh, throughout the entire Scotch whiskey industry. The end of the Boer War in South Africa during 1900 led to a reduction of spending by the British government on armaments and war-related materials and services, which played a part in the onset of a period of economic depression during the early years of the new century. Overall, Scotch whiskey output plummeted to below the 24 million gallons, or 109 million, million liters, marked in 1906, and grain whiskey production was particularly badly hit, falling from 21 million gallons, or 95.46 million liters, to 12.5 million gallons, or 56.82 million liters, during this period. By contrast, pot still whiskey production fell far less than might have been anticipated during the early years of the 20th century, after initially dropping from an 1898 level of just under 16 million gallons, or 72.7 million liters, to some 10 million gallons, or 45.4 million liters, in 1900. However, this had more to do with the accumulating of stocks than consistent demand for the product. The quantity of stock held rose from almost 90 million gallons, or 409 million liters, in 1898, to more than 120 million gallons, or 545.5 million liters, five years later. So one of the things that we see is there has to be in production um, good statistics for demand so that you're not overstocked. So you're only producing enough to in order to meet demand. The challenge is, is there is a lag in time, right? Because it's not like producing soda pop where you, you uh, produce it and six months later it's sold and consumed. You produce something and it spends 5, 10, 15, 20 years in a cask uh, and you're hoping that what you're producing now is going to be in demand 10, 15, 20 years later, right? So you have to be able to sort of forecast uh, what the demand's going to be and be able to meet those demands with producing enough. If you produce too little, then you're short in stock and you can't meet the demands, which then causes a problem because it increases prices. On the other hand, if you produce too much, uh, you end up with warehouses full of product that you can't get rid of. And consequently, the value goes down. A contributing factor was the death of Queen Victoria in 1901 and the ascension of King Edward VII. Taste changed dramatically with the rise of champagne and cocktails and the decline of the heavier, often sweeter drinks favored by the old queen. So who would think that just a change in a monarchy or in a president could have a huge impact on a product? Uh, back when Ronald Reagan was president back in the 80s, uh, it was known that he liked to eat jelly beans, jelly belly beans. And so uh, the, the sales of <laughs> jelly beans increased, you know. Same thing here except for it was a change in taste uh, in terms of spirits versus wines. My grandfather always told me that breakfast is the most important drink of the day. Good God, oh Lord. I want to shave my tongue right now. I'm getting drunk. <laughs> uh, what? You what? Yeah, okay. All right, so I hope you enjoyed this lesson in the history of uh, scotch whiskey and stay tuned to our next lesson because we are going to get out of this bust back into uh, another boom which will then lead to another bust which then leads into another boom uh, 
history tends to go in waves, up and down. And so the trick is to be able to sort of uh, read the tea leaves or be able to discern where we're at in history is understanding uh, those rises and those falls and those peaks and those booms so you can make the right decisions in terms of what you're buying, what you're stocking up on, uh, how much you're paying for something, what you're, what you're investing in, and, and so forth. All right, uh, that's it for this review. If you subscribe to this channel, I want to thank you very much. If you haven't yet subscribed, would you like to watch my videos? I would greatly appreciate it if you would share this video with others on Facebook, Twitter, and other social networking channels. And until next time, cheers.